We looked last time at the enormous efforts being made to discover how life could have created itself. On a supposedly primitive Earth long ago, or somewhere in space, even further back in time. Despite huge amounts of funding and time put in by many super-intelligent scientists and skilled technicians, those efforts have produced almost nothing. Another group of scientists have been spending their time doing real science, trying to find out how the creator's creation actually works. They've been looking at the simplest forms of life, particularly bacteria, and trying to find out how they work. They've been astoundingly successful. They've been able to find out many of the functions of biological machinery. They've learned how to use many of those machines and to modify some of the programs which control the functioning of those machines. Genetic engineering has become a force to be reckoned with on an alarming scale. How did all this happen? In 1869, a Swiss chemist called Friedrich Miescher examined the nucleus of white blood cells. He found what he called nuclein, which is now known as deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short. Other scientists carried on Miescher's work and discovered the chemical components of DNA and the way those components are joined together. In 1919, a Russian-born American chemist, Phoebus Levine, showed that DNA was a sequence of four different nucleotides, adenine, cytosine, guanine and thymine. In 1944, Oswald Avery and co-workers showed that inherited characteristics depend on DNA. In 1950, Erwin Shargaff showed that different species had different sequences of nucleotides in their DNA. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick showed DNA to have the form of a double helix. Since then, many microbiologists and genetic engineers have been working with DNA they found that about 3% of DNA was a kind of recipe for producing proteins. Some of those proteins are called enzymes. They usually act as catalysts, making reactions take place hundreds of thousands or even billions of times faster than they would naturally. One class of enzymes, called endonucleases, chop up DNA. In the late 1960s, Hamilton Smith found that a kind called restriction endonuclease cuts DNA at very restricted sites along the double helix. Endonucleases were studied in many organisms and were listed and classified as to which sites each would cleave. Choosing the right endonuclease enabled sections of DNA to be cut out. These snipped-out pieces could then be spliced into other strings of DNA, typically using yeast cells, and then put back into a bacterium. DNA coding for insulin was spliced into a bacterium, and now bacteria are producing insulin for diabetics commercially. It was found that bacteria have little circles of DNA called plasmids, which are not connected to chromosomes. Plasmids can contain genes which the bacterium can express. So by picking the right endonuclease to cut the plasmid in the right place and another endonuclease to cut out a gene from a foreign string of DNA, they could put the desired gene into the plasmid, put the plasmid in a bacterium and the bacterium would produce the required protein. Fuels and other things like pharmaceutical and agricultural items made by genetically engineered bacteria are now in production. And genetic engineering is roaring ahead at an ever-increasing pace. 
DNA uses only 20 different amino acids to make proteins, but there are many other kinds of amino acids. Genetic engineers are using them to create unnatural proteins. To do that, they've extended the genetic code in DNA and altered the transcription mechanisms so that novel amino acids can not only be coded, but can be made in existing cells. To be of any use, there have to be enzymes which can work on the new proteins. The design of enzymes is fiendishly difficult. An enzyme must have an active site which fits part of the substrate exactly to achieve what the enzyme was designed for. A protein is a long string up to thousands of amino acids and that string has to be folded to a very specific shape and that shape must include an active site if it is to work as an enzyme. An enzyme's active site must fit perfectly. There are astronomical numbers of ways that an enzyme could be folded, and very few, if any, would produce the required active site. So genetic engineers and computer programmers got together to write programs to try out folding possibilities. Using supercomputers, working for hours at a time, they've been able to find schemes to fold DNA sequences to give active sites. Using cunning techniques, they found out how to coax the cells' folding machines to fold those foreign enzymes. And to make use of those enzymes, they've engineered metabolic pathways to make the cell do what the engineers tell them to do to produce the products they want them to produce. Almost all of the cutting up of DNA has been done by naturally occurring enzymes, and most of the joining together of cut sections of DNA have been done by living organisms, particularly bacteria and yeast cells. But scientists are working on ways to do it themselves. In episode 21, we saw Karl Popper's assessment of the possibility of creating life by physics and chemistry. I brought up his analogy of the cell and DNA as a robot factory. The DNA is like a memory stick plugged into the computer controlling the robots which produce the complex machinery. The possibility of the whole system happening by itself is zero. But what we see happening in laboratories all over the world is equivalent to rewriting the information in the memory stick. Those complex machines could then be made to produce things like microbes completely unknown to our immune system with who knows what results. And with the astounding progress being made in the field of artificial intelligence, what might emerging of these two technologies produce? It took nearly a hundred years from the discovery of DNA to the determination of its structure. It then took less than 20 years to learn how to cut out and manipulate specific pieces of DNA. In the next 10 years, genetic engineering became commonplace. By 2021, the world was being injected with man-made RNA. Now, we're on the brink of proteins and life forms unknown to nature. A number of scientists have called for a halt in this headlong rush towards nobody knows what. They've called for some kind of regulation to try to guard against possible disastrous consequences. But they've been ignored. Instead, scientists are gleefully claiming they are on the way to creating new forms of life, and that seems very possible. In Genesis chapter 11, we read of a time when everyone spoke the same language they came together to build a tower to reach the sky and to make a name for themselves. And the Lord said, 
Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So to save them from destroying themselves, God stepped in to stop them. He confounded their language so they couldn't understand each other. Then he split them into nations, each speaking its own language. Today, there's one language of communication among scientists. All their major journals and their conferences are in English. Science communication is very swift worldwide. And as we've seen, all the scientists are building on the work of all the others. There's a determined effort to pour scorn on the very idea of God. There's a determined effort to prove that they can do anything, including creating life. The Bible warns us that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. I, for one, will not approach those perilous last days counting on scientists to behave responsibly, but thankful for the assurance that Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.